This is Simple Podcast number five with me, Remy Miller. Whoever said love is stronger than death was full of malarkey. There's no contest. Death is a sumo wrestler and it slams love to the mat every time. When my mother's husband died 12 years ago, her own life was pretty much sucked out of her, though she still walks and talks. I loved Mike too. Let me give you some advice. Unless you have deep religious faith, I have none at all, or objective detachment bordering on the abnormal, don't read the autopsy report of someone you loved. Now, Eleanor Cooney, the author of this book, Death in Slow Motion, My Mother's Descent into Alzheimer's, is very uh, illustrative with her writing. And she does a good job of conveying the thoughts surrounding what it's like for a family member to care for another family member who is suffering from a dementia of some sort. And for some reason, Alzheimer's has been one of those phenomenon to me, one of those phenomena to me where I, I, I wouldn't say I concern myself over it so much, but it's definitely something that's terrifying because you can really suffer from anything else. And it's still, at least still, live but if you have some sort of dementia and your brain is taken over by you know a malignant and veiling force then you really have no choice in the matter of, uh, you know to really it, it's almost not living because you're not even familiar with your first person experience and you have no continuity to your first person experience so it's very bizarre and it's something that i do not want myself and and is i i can imagine myself i do imagine myself um in the future when monetary funds are more available donating to alzheimer's research and support and care because it's 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 a crazy disease for the brain to just die from the inside out and Talking about love from that quotation that I read, it makes me think, uh, it makes me think that I personally may be qualified to look at an autopsy report, but at at the same time, I suppose every person thinks himself to be the rules exception, but perhaps by then I'll have softened up after, after I get some child rearing under my belt, you know, I have some kids that may do something to, to soften me up. And, uh, and make me less um, less capable of doing something like looking at an autopsy report of someone I've loved. But maybe it would be important. Maybe it would not be important. It's not a situation I've had to be in. So I can't say that in one way or the other, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be beneficial. It's it's one of those things you can't know perhaps maybe until you're in the moment because up until the the time when I have to do that or have the opportunity to do that, there will be more history that plays out with this person that I know. So who's to say that in the future, you know, maybe now I'm uncomfortable with it, but after, after my relationship develops with that person more and changes and alters positively, positively or, or negatively, I'll be more equipped to do that. It could also happen in the other other direction where I would be less equipped. Who knows what's going to happen in future history? So it would be imprudent to put a to put a a, a hard answer on that at this point. Because also what do you gain from doing that? What do you gain from learning the most gruesome corporeal details about a person you love if they're when they're dead they're dead in a way i'm not an expert on the topic i'm not someone with a lot of experience so 
I I can't say what that's like when uh, when I and when I say when they're dead they're dead I I mean that you know if they get in a if they if they die because of they they got mugged right and stabbed and bled to death in the street or something or the the ambulance didn't come in time uh do you really need to know the description of of how those uh, incisions were and the length of the incisions and which organs they penetrate and stuff you know that's that's not exactly uh on a need to know basis so hard to say but what a gruesome what a gruesome process to go through as the the one remaining alive having to or not i suppose not having to look at that it's not it's not law that you do so but uh choosing to do it in fact Moving on back to the book here. And writing? Forget it. My mother's prolific typewriter had always thundered away up on the top floor back home. Now it sat silent and dusty. She didn't like the action of the keys. She said, never mind that it was her own machine. So I got her another and another. Soon she had four typewriters lined up on her desk. Plenty of paper, pencils, whiteout. The only thing I ever saw her write was half a letter, never finished. And the effort cost her a week of fretting and fluttering. Now that really scared me. Writers, beware. It's one of the first things to go. <laughs> and and that was that was startling startling startlingly terrible for me because writing is a pursuit that every human should be participating in because it is not a matter of it's a hobby that you enjoy or an activity that you want to turn into a profession or that you have it as a profession. So you need to do it to, to keep up and, and, and stay sharp. Everybody should be doing it because writing is the vehicle that that manifests in reality the concepts within the mind and there is no better way to detach from your thoughts and understand exactly what it is you believe and how it is you believe than, than by writing. Writing just provides that perfect platform for you to be able to for you to be able to thoroughly synthesize and process the information passing through your mind. Because it's 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 transforming that language. When when that when the language goes from inside your body to outside your body, it, it transforms. It doesn't come out as you expect it. And once you're able to look at it and see what that first person experience is like of oh, okay, this is what I had in my mind, this was my intention, and this was the result, the more practice you have with that the more competency you'll have in day-to-day -day life when communicating with people. You'll be able to express your own ideas more clearly because you're used to the process of, of manifesting in reality those interior thoughts. And because you have, more familiar, you have more familiarity with doing that within yourself, you can do that for others. And when you listen to others, you can imagine what it is, what, what is their intent and what is the what is the main idea of what they're saying and then what are the nuances uh you know something new that they're putting on the table right now that you can understand quickly consolidate it down and then and then repeat it back to them and then that's of course the ultimate sign of having a fruitful conversation is when your summary or description of what the other person says they agree with it and you know you've done a really good job when they said actually yeah you you put that better than i did actually that should be your goal in conversation is is having the other person think that you describe their point better than they could have because that immediately establishes a relationship with that person where you are going where where you are aiming to understand and when you seek to understand then then common ground can be made and then you can move on with that conversation in a in a productive way because then you can present your point. And even if it's totally opposite, then 
you're still going to have a civil conversation because the person knows that you didn't just refute their argument outright or refute their point outright and and try and establish your own thing on top of theirs. No. You say, I'm here to listen to you. And when you are the first person to, based on your actions, show, expect, convey that you are there to listen, it is much more likely that the other person will follow suit in their action and stay quiet when you're speaking. Because the best way to the best way to be heard is to be quiet, essentially. Moving on from the book here. And of course, I was getting sick of hearing about it. Her complaints, her face gray with pain, her confusion, her questions about doctors, hospitals, and pharmacists, verbatim, virtually every day, as if we'd never discussed the topic before, became the components of purgatory for us all. She'd groan, stagger, weep, hold her stomach. As months progressed and nothing we tried worked, I came to live in a chronic state of rage and helplessness, rage at my failure, helplessness in the face of this infuriating, baffling stomach monster that wrecked any chance at all of making my mother's life even a little bit pleasanter. It was bad enough that she had to lose her mind. It was intolerable that she could also suffer physically almost all the time, that nothing could be done, that she couldn't remember she couldn't understand or remember how hard we tried, that even her doctor didn't want to hear about it anymore. That Mitch and I got so raw with impatience that we could barely stand to hear another word about it. It was like a nattering nightmare. Don't take it out on her. Don't take it out on her, I rebuked myself. Don't. Don't. And this is the confounding element of something like Alzheimer's is there is so much you can do. There's only so much you can do when it comes to another person. So in reality, we can't control other people. They will choose as they choose to do. However, there are elements of persuasion that you can use to have somebody do what you would like them to. This doesn't have to be manipul negatively manip manipulative or malicious in any way. This could just be you want your kids to lead healthy lives. So you exercise and eat healthy. And you make sure that you convey that in reality to, to these small humans so they pick up good habits. Um, it could be that you want... You, you want someone you're living with to, to clean more. So, you know, what you do, you clean more first. You, uh, you take that initiative and then the other person will follow. It could be a point that you're trying to make in conversation. So persuasion isn't just by trying to talk somebody into something. It can be through your action. It can be through talking somebody. It can be, it can be, Hey, you, you can be in a work situation, workplace situation. And the, the body of people thinking about the best way to solve this problem or go about, go about this project, there are multiple ideas out there. And when you listen to all the ideas, which you should be listening first, so all of the, all of the bad ideas get talked about and dismissed immediately. So then you have that detachment and elevation to be able to make a, a, smart, a smart remark about it. You have to be persuasive in what you're saying. So... We can do that with people on a normal basis because they, because minds, generally speaking, are susceptible to adjusting. However, when it comes to a demented person, that idea is out of the window. It's no longer possible because it's like the mind just defaults to a more primitive state in many ways. So failure and the abandonment of optimism, like all of life's stomach monsters, are the strongest demotivators of a helpless situation. Pure and noble resistance to it is, 
it's a fool's errand. So so rerouting then becomes the only viable retaliation. Never attack heavily guarded positions. Because if if you see a a, a strongly held position, a, a strongly defended position in front of you, which is this person's mind, it's not going to work by brute forcing your way through to that. And and making the most of it that you can um, is instead the, the better action and changing your behavior and your expectations and what is satisfying to you or what is a, a job well done in order to in order to be have contentment in that situation because there are a bunch of things that could happen that 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 would be that would be unideal in managing a relationship with a person and when managing that a relationship with a person involves dealing with a brain that is not entirely a person if that comment makes any sense yeah it, it's the i feel like it's the ultimate ego checker is that you can't this this is of all situations this is one in which frustration is the least justified. I'm not saying you can't get frustrated because it's going to happen. And that's something that she talks about a lot in this book, as you saw there with love at the beginning is, uh, and, and I think that's one of my annotations later on is talking about love that when you have to deal, when you have to change how you go about your relationship with someone that you once loved so much it, in in a way that involves dementia, love doesn't mean the same thing anymore. And that love can transmute, that love can straight up go away, that love can can just, uh, can just it, it's malleable. Love is very malleable, um, is I think one of the, the major themes of, or, or motifs or both of what, of what the author talks about, because Love is one of the more elusive concepts among humanity, generally speaking. And then when you when you talk about something that is very distinctly addressing what it is to be human, then you're 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 dealing with a tricky situation and it's and it's not easy to resolve. And the whole in the whole deal with that that the stomach the the stomach ache business is that she um you know the stomach monster is that is that the mother started drinking a lot because of slipping into dementia it was just uh, it, it eased her mind and it made her less stressed and less anxious and all this uh but it eventually evolved as she said she never would of course when she was entirely lucid that she would be, she she would say, no more than three martinis a night is justified. Or maybe it was once you get to your like you, you shouldn't be having a third just on a on a weekday, you know, um, just going about your business. You you shouldn't be downing that much every day. But then of course she started doing that, and they started trying to get her on uh on less intense stuff. I think they. They uh, started getting her on, well, they tried non-alcoholic wine at one point. She was averse to that. Um, they tried just straight up cutting it out. They tried a variety of things. They tried some nojitos. So, you know, mojitos without alcohol. I believe that's that's one of the things they tried as well. And the the alcoholism was in part fueling this this stomach monster that she had. It was, she was, it was always causing her grief. And it was not, it was not a good, it was, it was not a good business going on. Um, and it was, it was a very heavily recurring thing. And, and fortunately later on in her life, the mother, uh, Mary, Mary, the uh, Mary stomach monster definitely quelled over time. And that was in part by her, her increased quality of care and also not, also not, you, you know, halting the the heavy the heavy intake of alcohol also but we all have those stomach monsters we all have those stomach monsters and 
they'll be persistent in our mind and they'll capture our attention and drain it, in fact. And the really only solution when it comes to draining that stomach monster in your mind, whether it's a particular insecurity, maybe it's an event that happened recently that you're brooding over and you're, you're reminiscing over it in a negative way, you're ruminating, or it's a person that you're trying to deal with and, and you're, you're coming at you, coming to your wits end about how to manage this relationship because it's not the easiest thing. And, and, Maybe their ego's getting in the way. Maybe your ego's getting in the way, and you're 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 trying to you're trying to to you know use some fast footwork to to make your way through it and to make sure it's a successful and mutually beneficial relationship. Whatever it is that it is, your stomach virus. Um, maybe it can go away, but those things usually last for quite some time. So you got to learn to deal with it in the moment and be happy to deal with it in the moment so as to not just unnecessarily stress yourself out because that's a major problem that you can run into. That's that's one of my own personal faults is that I can can think about a particular uh, topic that maybe uh, arises some frustration or some anxiety or whatever it is and it'll just stay there. And it's hard to expel that from your mind. You really have to actively make the effort to, well, one, spend your time doing things that are important. Because if you're doing something that's important, more likely than not, your mind's not going to be distracted by whatever it is that uh, is heavily distracting in that moment. And also paying, uh, trying to find it trying to find the location of that thought in your brain in your brain because usually when it comes to things that bother us the more you pay attention to it the more it goes away where if you have uh let's say you've sprained your ankle and it's causing you some pain you're 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 laying on the couch doing some reading whatever and and you feel the pain in your ankle and you could say, "Oh man, I I hate this pain. I wish I wish it would be less. I wish I could I wish it could go away." But if you're to put down the put down the book and focus all of your attentions and energies on the sensation of pain in the ankle and of what it's like to experience that pain. What it, you know, yeah, yes, it's pain, but what is it? What is this sensation? And where is it? How big is it? Is it just one little square centimeter? Is it is it the entire bottom half of your of your leg? What you know? How going through the foot? How big is it? And pay attention to the qualities of it. And the more you do that, the more it goes away, and the more tolerable it is. Moving on, back to the book here. My mother told me once that if she ever got run over by a bus, I was to destroy a certain secret box of letters and journals so that Mike wouldn't have to see them. She showed me where she'd cleverly hidden them. Why did she keep them? Not for sentimental reasons, that's for sure. She kept them because she was a writer, and writers have a tendency to keep potentially risky stuff around. It wasn't that Mike would be angry or jealous or would make a scene if he saw it. She just didn't want to hurt him with graphic glimpses of her heavily populated past sex life. Mike had been married before, but he was an innocent compared to my mother. They escaped New York together permanently around 1970, moving to Connecticut to get married and live happily ever after. And for a good long time, they did. The town quickly fell in love with Mike. When he died, my mother got at least a thousand letters from grieving friends and even people who'd only met him once or twice. It was a tide, a torrent, and it lifted and carried her. Why is grief easier to bear when it's shared? It's a mystery, but it's so. And I want to add jubilation, too. Jubilation is easier to bear when shared. Um, And maybe easier isn't the right word when it comes to a more positive-oriented emotion like that. 
uh, but just better experienced in general. You get the most out of it. You get the most out of grief and you get the most out of joy around in the presence of others and shared with uh, shared with others. Because in, in joy among others, it multiplies and in grief among others, it, it diminishes. Because that social support, that that surrounding web of friends and acquaintances and inner circle loved ones uh it, as as the buddhists would say your sangha when you focus on that more and you allow yourself to be vulnerable in those circles you're going to receive more help from those people and more assistance and you're going to get if it's grief over whatever you're going through a lot faster and a lot less painfully. And it'll have you form better relationships with all those people. Because of those because of those vulnerabilities, people will be able to relate to you more. It is that which is most personal, which is most general. And Meaning that the the more you share about yourself, something that you may think is just this personal problem that's so unique to your life or that nobody else happens around you happens to be going through right now, that doesn't mean that it's not going to be useful for other people to hear the account of and to try and help you through it because then they're going to learn more about you. They're going to learn more about themselves. They're going to think more about how this applies to, to loved ones in their life. And it's going to generally improve your connections to everyone around you. So the lesson here is that it is important to share no matter what. Experiences are meant to be shared. It, it is simply the way for, it's simply the way for human beings. Community single-handedly dominates the list of the most important features of healthy living. You know, you got to you got to rely on others to th to thrive. It is said so often that we are a pack species and it's said that way for a reason, because because sharing and collaborating leads to multiplied growth. Two people can do more than 200 percent. Because then the strengths and weaknesses of each other's balance you're not wasting times on wasting time on things you're not good at you're able to maximize maybe you know you think about it in caveman days maybe one guy is good at running and another guy is is you know really scale really really skilled with his hands in terms of fine motor movement so maybe you have some guy who's just a total a total hunk that's running out and and killing an elk and carrying it back on his shoulders or dragging it behind him for for two and a half miles back to camp to be eaten whereas there's this other guy there that maybe he doesn't have the physical fortitude to do something like that but you know what he can he he can skin and prepare this thing to eat in 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 24 minutes you know from beginning to end and and that and that's his skill and then you're able to save time that way because then you come back from this hunt, you're exhausted, you want to take a you want to take a, a five, 10 minute break, then you gotta do this thing. You're you know, you're you're still tired, so you gotta you gotta put more effort into doing that. You know, it's it it's it, you you there's less waste with collaboration. So that's ultimately the the benefit of it there. This one is really this this is also another recurring theme here in the book and it's it's really a tricky one because what do you do with a person in this state let's get to it here and then i'll continue august we're riding in the volvo which needs new tires a new steering rack and a new muffler She's always in the car with me because she wants to go with me everywhere I go. It's impossible to get to the car and out the driveway without her seeing me. 
Sometimes I'm able to sneak away by going out the side door of the house, hunching over and crawling into the passenger side of the car, but usually I get busted. There's nothing at all wrong with her eyes and ears. I'm alone all the time, she says, alone and staring at the wall, reminding her that she's in fact rarely alone, except for a few hours in the morning, if I'm lucky, does no good. In her mind, she's alone all the time. So there's all this about community, which is beneficial for us and really along all axes that you can imagine. And when you have the opportunity to build a community around you and build a positive community around you about other people that care and about, uh, you know, about people that you care about and people that care about you. That's all great, but that's only if you recognize that there is a community around you or a community can be ra- can be made around you. But in this case, the mother, Mary, just doesn't have the wherewithal to understand that there are other people supporting her. To her, she's alone in this thing. and And these people just abandon her. And they, they leave her alone because think about it like this. When you're, when you have no short term memory and you're constantly forgetting things, that means that you could have, you could spend three hours of time with someone and you could be having a great time. It could be, it could be a full on memorable party. You're, you're dancing, you're, you're having good food, having good, having good beverages doing whatever it else it is you're doing, having good conversations, all is just going well. And then at, you, you, you go home 10 minutes later and you think that you're all alone because <laughs> you have no short-term memory. So those people that were there a little bit ago are no longer there. And the only thing that's there now is loneliness. And in a very perverse way, dementia, Alzheimer's is, is, is a form of mindfulness, but not a beneficial kind. Because with the beneficial kind, you're able to quell the anxieties within you more effectively. And with this kind, (laughs) this involuntary kind of mindfulness, there's nothing else that you know. So if there's nothing else you know, then what is there to enjoy? Because you you enjoy my enjoying the present moment as a result of mindfulness is is an enjoyable experience because you know that there is more which can be distracting, but which you're voluntarily not allowing to distract you. And there's a gratification that comes along with that voluntary abstinence from distra- from distraction but when it's totally involuntarily involuntary totally not of your own volition and you have no choice but to be confined only to the present moment man that's rough it's really rough and Having So having that community must be paired with knowing that it's there in the first place. Conviction of its presence is equal to its actual presence. So know your community and do things to reify its, uh, it, it, how alluring it is. Because that's, a, that's another element. Just like it is with mindfulness, this whole voluntary versus involuntary mindfulness if you are, you know, when it comes to forming your community, you have to actually make actions to, to, to grow that you have to reach out to people and talk. You have to do things for other people. You have to ask other people to do things for you. And this is how you build rapport. This is how you build a relationship. And then that's how a, a community is going to form around you. It's not going to happen just by happening to meet people and then you meet that person and all of a sudden they're part of the community. Having a community is a practice. So it's something 
that requires perpetual reinvestment. And I'm not saying that that it's a it's a minute by minute hourly or minute by minute or hour by hour pursuit that is that has to take up all of your time to maintain because you can do it in a not so often way and if based on the personalities of the other people in that group that's that's how they roll then you can form a strong a, a strong mutual web of bonds like that but that is not necessarily the case you got to do moving on back to the book I was hoping I could have lunch with you, she'd say, using the same piteous voice she used when she asked if there was enough food for her to have dinner with us. I'm alone all the time. This was my mother. What was I to do? Was I to say, no, mom, take your food and march back out to your cottage and cook there and leave us alone? Mitch, which is her husband, Mitch occasionally succeeded in turning her around, firmly and usually kindly, but it was almost impossible for me. So to give you some background on Mitch, the whole situation here is Mary, the mother, Mary to Mike, Mike died. That is, that is Eleanor's, the author, that is Eleanor's suspicion of what, what onsetted what onsetted her Alzheimer's and dementia is that they had such that they were both writers and they, they traveled all over the place. They wrote about certain topics where they had to go around a country that they went around the United States uh, across so many, probably visited almost every state tracking the story of this one person. And I, I don't have the, the reference on hand immediately, but it is talked about in the book. And they just had one one grand time doing this, writing about this this man, basically doing a biography on him and going to all these places together and kind of living off the land in some cases. And they also went on other trips where they where they just camped out. So they had this really lively, active relationship full of love and and death is is one of the the death of a loved one is one of the criteria for, for post-traumatic stress disorder. So if you are in such, if you are in such a relationship like that and they die, depending on the type of person he was and who she was, that can lead to a bad situation. And if you're not able to mentally recover from that and you're not durable enough to withstand the pressures of an, of an incident like that, you can crumble. And maybe it's not even voluntarily crumbling. Maybe you want to get better, but it's just hard and it overcomes you and it washes over you and, and your, your nose falls below the surface and then it can cause and then something like that can cause de- a dementia or Alzheimer's. And it's crazy how something, so two things that you would think are so not necessarily unrelated, but, but that such a physical reaction can happen to, to a conceptual thing. I mean, somebody dying is very physical there. And it is a physical body that is no longer roaming the world. You are no longer, no longer interfacing with that collection of molecules anymore. But in a way it is something conceptual death, a a, a person, a personality no longer persisting. It's strange. And to think that that can spur a physical change in the brain. I mean, you think i think it's just because of the the social stigma against mental health and mental disorder is that it's just as real as as physical ailments you break a leg or you get a leg amputated that's something that's very tangible and very real and it affects you on an everyday basis but you know what so do things that go on in the mind you experience the death of a loved one 
that's going to affect you on an everyday basis, you know, for for a while, for several days, several weeks, it's going to be overcoming. And there's a process of how you lift yourself out of that. And you don't, you don't ever entirely lift yourself out of that. I have yet to, uh, encounter such a thing in real life. Nobody super close to me has died yet. So I can't, I can't say this for sure, but of the accounts I've heard of other people, um, yeah, after, after some time you, you, you begin to pull yourself together, but it's such a bizarre thing. So that was, that's, that's the, the backstory of, of how this is important here. And Mitch, so this is, this is his mother-in-law and, you know, Eleanor just, just does nothing but sing his praises about how much he sticks in there, how much he does the hard stuff, like turn her away out of the kitchen when she's when she complains about being alone and, and and doing all that he can to support his partner and to support his mother-in-law too and what makes me think about what what this makes me think about is how the distinction is formed between being crass and being kind when the demented person can't distinguish it herself. So ought ought the family to to care what they think best to to do what they think is best for the person, regardless. You know that that thing could be pleasant in the in the experience of the demented person, or not pleasant in in her experience. Um, but you just got to do what's you just got to do what you ought to in that moment. And in this moment, they were exhausted. They were stressed. Uh, that's something she talks about all the time. It's just it, especially when you don't have the money, because if you have the money, you can throw your your Alzheimer's laden uh, mother into a into a, um, a a care facility. And and, you know, they'll take care of that easy squeezy. But those things are expensive. It's it's lots of money a day. You gotta you, you think about you measure the cost based on the price per day is how expensive this is. And if you don't got the money for that, it's hard. You know, there can be the savings of the demented person because they're not really gonna need too much of it anymore for living their own life because they don't have the functional capacity to do so. Um, of course, depending on the severity, but yeah, you can rely on the, on whatever savings that person may have, but then it just comes down to your own savings and loans and, and help from friends and loved ones, contributions, stuff like that. It's stressful. So It gets so so that's something she talks about a lot. And then when you're dealing with it yourself, when you don't have the money to do so, is there really ever an excuse to be crass? Or should you I mean, no, the answer is no, you should be kind at all times. Because if you're crass, that means you're allowing it to, to get through to your ego and, and you're allowing yourself to get frustrated. But as Eleanor Cooney says, no matter how saintly you think, you are and your patience and your tolerance and and all of this it's going to get to you you will have frustrating moments you will get agitated you will have some condescension in your voice at times you will commit these crass acts and it's not going to feel pleasant when it comes out of your mouth or comes out of your body uh and it's not justified but it's so hard to push away it's so hard to push away because it's it's like it's like an immovable force that you're trying to or or an unstoppable force that you're trying to redirect somehow and it's difficult for that to do nothing but just go straight through you, you know? 
Um, and this is actually a, a perfect, a perfect example of something like that, of, of how it is that you just need to, you just need to really monitor your thoughts at every moment. And it'll, it'll definitely be a, a book that I cover at one point, but there's a book called the heart of the Buddhist teachings and it's written by a Vietnamese monk. And, and one thing he says in the book is to ask yourself, even, <laughs> even uh, write it or paint it up and put it on the wall. Are you sure? Asking yourself in every moment, are you sure? Are you sure that you should be responding in this way? Are you sure that you should be having this, this severe of an emotional uh, reflex? Or should you be more chill about this event that's occurring right now? This example here is wonderful Wonderful for that. So it's a conversation between them two. And I believe they're in the car. So it opens up with, with the mother talking. If I need to be taken care of, why didn't you come back and live in Connecticut? Why did I have to come out here? That's one thing she would ask all the time because she would... Um, she would she would talk about all of the options back home in Connecticut where where they grew up to to live but now now the author l was living in California cuz she could not take Connecticut anymore and she's having a good time out there and then and then her mother came down with alzheimer's um so so this is their conversation if i need to be taken care of why didn't you come back and live in Connecticut why did i have to come out here it's a blazing sunny day. We're, we're sitting out on the deck. So I was wrong. They weren't in the car. They're sitting out on the deck. Mom, if I went back and lived in Connecticut, I'd go crazy. Why? Why? I'm not 25 anymore, Mom. You think of me as 25, but I'm not. If I went back there, I'd feel old. I'd feel young. I feel young out here. You couldn't feel, feel young in Connecticut? No. God, no. I'd feel time speeding up. I'd be old before my foot touched the ground. How old are you now? Take a guess. Oh, 35? <laughs> I wish. I snort. Why would you feel old in Connecticut? Oh, God. Where do I begin? For one thing, the seasons are too distinct. They rush by like a speeded up slideshow. Summer, fall, winter, spring. Summer, fall, winter, spring. It's relentless. You can never forget how fast time is going by. It's a, little, it's a little easier to forget about that out here. But you had a good time growing up there. Yes, I did. It was great. And it's beautiful. You know so many people there. So many good friends. That's absolutely true, too. It's just... Christ. It's so hard to explain. I just couldn't. But I want to be in Connecticut, surrounded by my friends. The people who knew Mike. Mom, I couldn't. I couldn't go back to Connecticut. I, I'd go crazy if I did. And I wouldn't be able to take care of you or myself. Why? I'd feel like a total failure. Like I never got anywhere. Old. Sad. Trapped. Well, I don't understand. Don't understand what? Why don't you come back to Connecticut to live? It's such a, a helpless situation. <laughs> I, 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 I think of that exchange. And to, to make this point, this is how the chapter ends. This is how the chapter ends on this, on this bit of dialogue here, uh, on, this, on this exchange sitting out on the porch. And it just leaves you with that. There's one line after it says, a good question. When I was asking myself all the time now. Why, indeed. And it's, 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 I, I can't think of anything else than other, anything other than helpless. It's, it's such a bizarre situation. And like many times of tribulation, is this when the game must be played? 
an outright and direct sense of being satisfied with the quality of your care. So just as simple as sitting on the porch, having a conversation with your mom um, is impossible. You, you can't be sure if this little chat that you're having with her is causing her more stress or is quelling her stress. So do you just maintain patience and find the answer, whatever it is to quell that, that incoming confusion? Because her mom's confused. That's what she said. She said she doesn't understand. And, and it's easy to write that off. Oh, of course she doesn't understand. She has Alzheimer's. That's going to be the case with everything. Of course she's not going to understand, but Think about it from her perspective. You know, she's saying, I don't understand why you can why you can't come back to Connecticut. It doesn't make sense to me. And is this a moment where you just you have your patience and you you talk to her calmly and in the same tone and with the same consistency and all of that good stuff? And then and then you just do that ad infinitum until until the topic wears out or she wants to move on or or do you kind of play the game a little bit and she's looking for an answer you know uh eleanor gave her a whole bunch of gave her gave her some some pretty good reasons and explanations uh and clarifications but that she still wasn't, she still was the, you know, mom still wasn't buying it. So do you just give her any answer? If it's a lie, if it's, if it's entirely fabricated, if it's only a half truth, a quarter truth, an eighth truth, you know, what do you, what, what do you do? Do you just try and progress that conversation past the point where you're stuck in that loop? It's really tricky. I think that's one thing that this book has has shown to me above almost all other themes in this book. This idea of total unpreparedness. Being totally unprepared for how to manage a relationship like this. What do you do with a person like this? Like, like it's it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate kind of it, it this this book is like a guide to how to think about relation unconventional relationships, atypical relationships. Not a guide in the sense that it tells you what to do and how to manage them because she says at all points, I was a horrible human being and I didn't know what I was doing handling the situation at all turns until it was too late. So it, it, it's not a guide. It's not a, a how-to guide, but and it's not a how not to guide. It's just what is happening. That's that's literally what this what this book is describing is what is happening in this relationship what's going on just this total confusion because as confused as mary is so is eleanor so is eleanor eleanor is of course in a state of complete lucidity but that doesn't mean she's in a state of complete comprehension and and every time mary does or says something that is that is uh, kind of representative of the weirdness of the, of the nature of dementia. It, it's completely new to Eleanor too. So she's equally as confused as to how to respond to something like that. So man, is it a tricky situation? So let's move on here. Let's move on here. Um, at this point, she is talking about uh, one of her other husbands. So after, uh, gosh, I, I'm, I'm forgetting the sequence now. Um, I, I believe this was after Mitch, sorry, Mitch is Eleanor's husband after, after Mark died after, sorry, Mike, I can't believe I got the name wrong after Mike died. Um, she kind of went on a string of other of of marriages and relationships with other people, kind of boyfriends and husbands, and some of them were not so great. I think they might I think they might have come before though. 
is that yeah because because there's her biological father and then there there was uh, another another man after that there might have been two men after that and then she landed on on mike and then after mike there there was no one serious as far as my my recollection um suggests so this is talking about one of the other one of the other guys so so let's start here the letters saved over the years were from various guys neil among them he was a pretty good writer himself his letters were particularly throbbing between the letters and my mother's journals her byzantine love life was pretty well covered i remembered all the guys and a couple of them were surprises to me so that so that's another thing that um there were there were a few more serious guys, you know, the the three or four that I mentioned, but Eleanor liked her men. We'll put it that way. <laughs> so continuing here, a couple and a couple of them were surprises to me. I'd think him, geez. Then I'd think, well, uh, yeah, I guess I can see that. And one of them, oh, shocking, has been a student at the prep school where my father taught. A big, hulking, precocious guy fulfilling every school kid's wet dream. Did he first nail her while he was still a student? That part wasn't clear, but the rest of it was more than clear. I learned a lot from the contents of that box. One of the things I learned was that Durant was pretty much a dud in the sack. Probably this hadn't been so evident in the beginning of their affair, what with the excitement of the globe trotting, the, illust the illustrious company he kept, and all the rest of it. But, but he wasn't a giver. Not in the, may not in the ways that my mother yearned for. I remembered her cry, you don't want me. You don't need me. A couple years into their union, she went to a psychiatrist. She wanted to find out why she had married such a distant, loveless man. Those were the days of classic Freudian analysis. What she found out, surprise, was that she had married a guy just like her father. But the psychiatrist apparently was intrigued. He wanted to see for himself. He asked for a session alone with Tim Durant. And uh, so, so Tim Durant was... A f was a guy that was very well acquainted in the Hollywood circle, knew a lot of people, um, and that was that was the culture that he was immersed in. So he was he was I mean she used the word globe trotting and that's kind of what it was. This guy was just globe trotting around the world um, and wasn't a very wasn't a very solid husband to her, uh, and and she had those outbursts for very good reason. Um, and she actually, the, uh, she continues on about how it went talking to the psychiatrist like that. And, and basically the psychiatrist said, stay as far away from this guy as he possibly can. He is a nutcase. He is totally, I I'll go. He said he called Tim Durant and this as an exact quote, a psychiatric monument and said to her, I don't usually tell my patients this, but my advice is to get as far away from that man as you possibly can immediately. <laughs> so you can see the type of the, the, the constitution of this man's character was, was not of um, very high value. And the part I highlighted was that he wasn't a giver. And not the ways that that her mother needed, and here I was I was thinking about my, my the relationship with my partner, and and this fear of abandonment that comes up from past relationships, and how that provides the basis of saying such things, and it's painful to hear such things because it could. It could be a totally negative sign and a totally um, true sign, as it is in this case, where it's just this guy that's just so horrible and 
should not have a relationship, w- at least with this woman. Apparently, he was so bad, really, people should be staying away from in- from him in general. But at least for her, she had to stay away from him. And um, it could be for totally de- legitimate reasons like that. It could also be from past insecurities about how, you know, relationships that are likely familial, those are the ones that generally have the most influence over our life going forward, um, you know, maybe it could just be root, rooted back from that. It could be rooted in that. And it could not be exactly because of the partner, but due to that background influence. And that's okay, because you can go about healing that. You just have to acknowledge it. You have to face it. And and after doing that, you can you can start to quell that and put it to rest. And it will never go away. That's the thing about insecurities and interge- intergenerational trauma is that that crap doesn't go away. But all you but but what you can do is car- compartmentalize it and put it in its and put it in its Tupperware and you can you can stack it in the cupboard and you can keep it there and you know it's there. It's always going to stay there, but it's not going supernova and taking over your life and causing you to have uh, to, uh, causing your relationships to be less mutually beneficial than they could be. And and they arise because they are they are so ingrained, but that the fact that it's ingrained within us doesn't necessarily mean that it has to manifest outside of us in a in a big way, in a serious way. So be mindful of your insecurities and and what's an insecurity versus what is a genuine feature of the situation you're in, the person you're talking to, the person you're in a relationship with. And it's relationships of all kinds. It could be work relationship, home home relationship, you know, in the house relationship, um, other other friends that aren't work related and aren't in the house, um, family that lives in the house or does not live in the house. It applies to all of this. So back to the book here. One thing she talks about is is ghosts that's a motif in this book and she mentions them as ghosts in the mind ghosts of the mind uh especially when she's talking about kind of going to these these uh care facilities for alzheimer for for demented people and um basically just old people that can't take care of themselves anymore but more more so related to to mental health issues rather than just you know pure old age like a hospice um or or from kind of physical quote unquote vis- physical diseases um so that's what she means when she talks about ghosts because and I think that's a good description too because when you think about it the ghosts, you know, ghosts in the mind is a great description of dementia. There is something, there is someone that was once there. That's what a ghost is. There was someone that was once and is no longer and just kind of floats about <laughs> aimlessly. What do ghosts do? They don't, you don't think of ghosts as having pastimes or hobbies or occupations other than, you know, Maybe haunting people or houses or objects. Um, there's there's a great album called Guilty Ghosts. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that. And when I say great album, I don't mean that it is a it is a musical monument, just like the psychiatrist said. I'm not saying it's a it's a musical monument of you know the best that music has to offer but it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's, it's got the, it's got the, the chill vibes to it. Um, and it's very textural. That is a common feature of the music I tend to like is very textural. And there are very few tracks in there, which have any lyrics. One of them I like, one of them I don't like. And 
uh, you're you're just gonna be in for something that you can put on and you can really put on the background if you want or just get invested in the textures that you notice both good anyway let's continue on about these ghosts here back to the book sometimes i feel like one of those ghosts i think back on a morning about a month before i wake to the sound of my mother's voice in the hall outside the bedroom i jump up and open the door there she is dressed and groomed talking on the phone leaving a message on an answering machine my answering machine She's using one of my phones to call the other one right there in the same house. It's a chilling little moment, not unlike the moment in the movie The Eye the Needle, where the heroine discovers that her lover, played by Donald Sutherland, is a Nazi spy. She walks in on him while he's in the middle of sending a radio message in German. He goes on with his transmission, calmly, coolly, terrifyingly looking right at her. My mother looks right at me. While she finishes her message, her voice perfectly normal. Anyway, dear, I'd like to see you. Come and pick me up as soon as you can. Had I become a ghost? Had she? Or had we become ghosts together? How do you love someone who doesn't know you? Do you love someone who doesn't know you? What is love with only one participant? A stare as blank as a manila folder is the, the focal point of the whole room in this case. And that blank stare, the absence of love destroys hope and, and the past and the future and the self if the love was big enough. So love is one of those things where it leads to an infinite expanse of possibilities in this world of doing good for others. And that's something I've come to learn in the past couple years is how love, how, how experiencing love, receiving it and giving it and practicing it how it changes one's outlook on what it means to be a person in the context of other people. What is, what is the purpose and implication of the actions of a human on other humans? But when you have a situation like this, where love really is one-sided in a way, Eleanor is looking after her mother, but not getting anything in return. And that's not necessarily, you know, love, love is symbiotic. Yes. Uh, but love is given unconditionally. That's what love should be. So the fact that it's not reciprocated is okay. But that doesn't mean it's any less harrowing to experience. So that's why this book is rough because it has you think about love in such a in such a bizarre context in such a unique way that you that at least I have not considered before. I think it would be the same for a lot of other people too that read this and I suggest the book of course, I have to make the disclaimer that I'm breezing through a lot of this book. And a lot of the a lot of the crazy mental mayhem that goes on in the in in your mind as a reader is is with all this other is is with all the other material. You know, I'm only covering a small portion of this. So Even if you've dealt with the disappearance of love, just like she said. So when I, when I, at the beginning was reading about the autopsy report, that was in the second paragraph of the first page. So that's from the beginning of the book all the way up to now. 
This is about halfway through it. Um, and when you have that much time to think about how love applies in this relationship and what it means to exercise and practice love with this dynamic, it, it leads to thoughts that are so that, that have come about. I think even if you've read the autopsy report of someone and you have the experience of a person uh, dying and so love terminating on, on that end of the person finite, fin, finitely and finitely, absolutely and squarely, you know, um, whereas when it comes to Alzheimer's, there's, there's the mystery does, does this person even recognize me? I'm staring, I'm standing right in front of her. She's looking me in the windows of my soul. And she's asking me to come pick her up because she feels lonely. Is that love? Is is love going in the direction from, from mother to daughter? It, 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 Alzheimer's is, a, is the black hole of the brain. And trying to imagine what it's like having that mental process man it's it's confounding this this the, that's the best word that could, that i can think of for this book is just confounding so so here we go um i will i'll give the the context to this after i read it um or or, or some part of the context of this after i read it but she's in one of these care facilities. She's gone through, the daughter, Eleanor, has gone through a lot of effort to find a good one. A lot of them are super expensive or the care is really bad. Or um, her mother has actually um, became more of a severe case of Alzheimer's and was really, she was difficult to take care of because she would have outbursts of anger. That's often what happens with Alzheimer's is uh, is an anger outburst and because it's, it's coming out of pure confusion they are angry out of confusion and they don't recognize it as that but that's what happens and she was kind of violent with this at these different facilities uh and and got <laughs> shuffled around she got kicked out of one or two um uh, other ones just didn't work out so she's at one of these now and this is what she's uh this is what she's talking about uh, they're they're standing there with the the nurse the 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 nurse or doctor, and uh, so so here back to the book, he flips through her already amazingly thick medical charts, letting us see bits and pieces, but keeping a firm grip on it. He's determined that we not actually hold it in our hands. Mitch especially knows that this is not legal. Families have every right to see medical records, but we tacitly agree that it would be imp impolitic to make a scene. He blathers on about medications, psychological tests, blood tests, EKGs, but it quickly becomes evident that their main business is to tinker with her multiple medications, scarcely cleaning up her way, scarcely cleaning her up the way I thought they would. They are simply doing their job, fine-tuning her to be an ideal sedated nursing home candidate, a consumer of costly drugs. An attendant comes in, says, Mary has heard our voices and wants to see us. They bring her in. Take another little piece of my heart. The vest, which actually has a cute decorative pattern on it, cavorting lambs or bunnies or some fucking other thing like that, has long, dangling, and very serious-looking canvas straps. The chains on Marley's ghost, a nurse, is holding my mother up when she sees me she forcefully shrugs and the woman's hand from her arm and says let go of me she hugs me as if she hasn't seen me for 10 years mitch too so i i mentioned that because that was the first and i believe only time that she uses profanity in the book <laughs> cavorting lambs or bunnies or some fucking thing like that. It's just an epitome of her. Uh, 
of her total lack of understanding of how it is these people, these demented people are supposed to live even meaning, minimally meaningful lives when the the modus operandi for these humans, for these demented humans going into a lot of these facilities, especially the lower ends, the lower end ones that don't cost two arms, two legs and a nose to get into um, their, their, their strategy is just let's drug these people until they're easy to deal with, which is not so great. And then in Mary's case, she just, she, she did not react well to the medications and it was, was numbing her. And then she would have outbursts in contrast to this numbing and it was not okay. Um, so it's just representing Eleanor's mounting frustration and desperation and anger at how these places treat the patients. These these cavorting bunnies seem uh, an unintentional concealment of the mundane atrocities of this place, of all places, of this disease, one of mundane atrocities to patients and love and vitality. Really is a really is a mundane atrocity because you think you you think of it in terms of what changes when when you are demented uh you're you're still functional you're bodily functional you can go you can move around life but life isn't really happening so it's an atrocious situation but it's mundane because you couldn't tell. There's actually one point in the book I don't think I I annotated on it where where she goes back um and she she ends up meeting with an old friend of hers. The mother ends up meeting an old friend and they're together and a photograph is taken of them and and Eleanor describes it as if you were to look at this photo because because you know her mom just aged really well for some reason, both in appearance and in physical constitution she just kind of stayed put together, um, even in even in her older age. Um, she, you know even when demented still physically active and physically capable, um, you know based on this photo of of this her and this other woman of a of similar age the other woman actually looked like she was you know if you had to guess which one was demented you would you would say you she would have said the other woman when in fact it was her mother um so it it's it's mundane because it's not instantly noticeable but man does it wreak havoc and I would say that 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 excerpt there is, which is on the same page and carries on to the next page of this other um, of this other thing she describes. So, so what I just what I just read is is kind of penultimate to this point that's being made here. So, continuing on, and I this this one is a little longer, but I have to read the whole thing because. It's this is one of the most powerful moments in the book, in my opinion, at least for myself. The shrink and the nurse can't get out of there fast enough. We're alone with my mother. We sit there on the nog hide sofas. Her hand is bad bandaged from her fall. Her eyes are red rimmed, inflamed and struggling to focus. She fiddles with the canvas straps. She looks at us from another planet. We try to explain why she is there, why she can't leave with us that day, but the truth is, we don't know the answers to those questions. We know we are no different from the other dissembling morons who've been holding her prisoner for a week. There is a stupid, destructive pointlessness to the entire proceeding that's been starkly revealed so that it's impossible to ignore hide or rationalize years ago i went to the dublin zoo reputed to be one of the best in the world the animals supposedly lived in natural habitats and were much happier than other zoo animals i remember standing on one side of a moat 
which separated me from the orangutan habitat. habitat. The moat was not very wide, maybe 15 feet, but apparently that was enough because orangutans hate water and the moat was as effective as a set of steel bars. One big scruffy male squatted at the water's edge on the other side of the moat and looked directly into my eyes. What I saw in those eyes, which are virtually human, was unambiguous. I knew what he was seeing. Another ape of some sort. An enemy ape who was free while he was not. He was a prisoner, and what I saw in his eyes was pure psychotic hatred. What I saw in my mother's eyes that day was not so different. Just substitute betrayal, bewilderment, and bitterness for, for hatred. Drugged, crazy, abandoned, and tortured, my mother still could not hate me. She still loved me, and I was unworthy of that love. I felt like the lowest piece of shit on earth. She was fighting, fighting through the chemicals like someone in a hypnagogic state who can't quite come out of a dream, trying to make sense of it but talking crazy, but talking crazy talk at the same time. So that's really the one sentence concept statement of what confounds me about Alzheimer's. This is what I like about that segment of the book, that book right there. And what I highlighted was near the beginning when I said that there is a, a, a stupid, destructive pointlessness, that part, and then, and then the part about the, the big scruffy male all the way up to the pure psychotic, pure psychotic hatred. And it was such a, it, it was, it was an ultimate description for me and is, is an ultimate description for me because how do you reconcile your human pathos in regarding a demented person when all when when all you see in their eyes is just this ape trying to figure it out you know that's that's what that's what humans are on a general basis it's just some kind of ape or just some kind of ape on a some kind of monkey on a rock and we're trying to figure out what we should be doing on a moment to moment basis on a year to year basis generation to generation basis and we don't know exactly what we're doing but we're trying to figure it out so in that way we are the same thing as this scruffy male and it's crazy to think that looking at an orangutan like that you see another ape you see something so similar to the self You see in his eyes a certain psychosis. And when I say certain, I mean that not that it's some kind of psychosis, but an absolute psychosis. It is certain. It is... It is irretrievably present. And it is a psychosis that every ape, every ape tries to mitigate, tries to deal with. With humans, we do it on a bit of a higher level. With something like an orangutan in a zoo setting, I think there is a pure psychotic hatred there. There has to be. Because orangutans are self-aware. Just like you know you exist and how you're 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 rocking and rolling about this world. That's what they're trying to do, but they can't rock and roll. They're just squatting at the edge of a moat, staring at their equally sentient prison guards. Ridiculous. That's why I don't like zoos. And to think about this in the context of another self-aware ape, it's it's bizarre. And that's what it's like looking, I imagine, well, as Eleanor describes, looking into the eyes of someone with Alzheimer's. 
is just a just an ape. Back to the book. So there was Mike. Semi-conscious under the fluorescent lights. So the, so what happened was Mike died. Um, he from birth had this like this blood pulmonary problem, and he had he had it, it was visible on his on his right arm, I believe, and it just kind of it was this large kind of red venous uh, appearance that was on his right arm, and he came to live with it, and you know it. When it came to his self confidence or anything like that, it, he he came to live with it very very easily. He would he would throw out his right arm, his right hand in confidence to give a handshake, like "Hey, boom! This is what I got going on," and he was okay with that. And at one point, he was getting surgery for this. Um, so th- so that's what's going on here. Semi-conscious under the under the fluorescent lights, suspended tenderly at the center of the life-sustaining web, respirator down his throat, chuffing and hissing rhythmically. Catheter, IVs, heart and blood pressure monitors, hoses, clamps, wires, sensors, exquisitely acute machinery, beeping, whirring, clicking, graphs and arcane greenish readouts moving by on screens bad arm elevated on pillows thick wide vertical bandage on his chest where they had sawed through his breastbone deeply gravely wounded but alive i remember watching his eyes as he tried to focus them and noticing how blue they were i also remember being appalled i'd never seen i'd never been in an icu before this I decided is a place to be avoided at all costs. My mother took it with equanimity. All this equipment looked beautiful to her. She was radiant. The surgery was over. He'd made it. He was still on this side of the line. With her. So this point comes well into the book. It's not like you get the... It's kind of interesting how she lays it out because his death was very, was very likely the, 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 the jump starter to her Alzheimer's and, and the Alzheimer's of her starts, you know, at the beginning of the book, but, you know, only, only a couple hundred pages in, are you getting close to the the conclusion of Mike's story and I say close because um I don't think I covered in another annotation so I can say it he 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 survives the surgery and ends up dying about a week later so it's kind of good news very bad news situation there and uh so so that's the significance to say that he that the surgery was over and he survived in this moment because that that survival didn't last for long um and this comes later in the book and and you know the story of his life is kind of uh unveiled over that amount of time and and i think it was for very good reason i think i got at this point why she decided why eleanor decided to detail mike's story as much as she did because yes because he's critical to mary's story but also has a parallel to some other kind of death. Both died of the body's rot, his beginning in his arm and through his body and hers from within the brain, slowly dying, not knowing. They both died slowly, unaware of its progression. In in different ways, she didn't know because she couldn't know she did not she literally did not have the cognitive faculties because those cognitive faculties died off for her to be able to understand that situation it's literally complete ignorance she doesn't know what she doesn't know type of thing um with with him it was it was also not knowing not knowing what he didn't know he didn't know that he didn't know this was going to get to this point. You know, maybe it was going to stabilize over time. It was it was slowly killing him. Who knows when it was going to happen? Who knew that following a surgery 
that was that's uh, of course surgery purportedly going to fix a situation that it was that it was going to end that way and and they are disparate but still congruent situations dying without knowing i recently had an experience where someone i know was uh, figured out that that this individual is is susceptible to a certain um to a certain terminal illness that it's not necessarily going to happen but it could happen and it's and it's not a pleasant percentage the likelihood that it could happen and it's crazy to think about that because you can just get that news at some point. You can just straight up get that news. And that's something I think about. I wouldn't say all the time. I'm not a hypochondriac constantly thinking about the various things that are going to kill me. I mean, I, I have some level of concern. You know, something happens. I'm like, oh, is that, you know, I, I, I can in my mind exaggerate a little bit. But I'm not stressing myself on a moment to moment basis about it. But sometimes that's that's productive to think about is if right now I were to get diagnosed and not just say you have the susceptible, a certain percentage of a susceptibility to, to getting this terminal illness. But what if I just straight up learned it right now? Like, Hey, you have this, you have this terminal illness. We all do. I mean, we we're all, we all have a terminal existence, but it really changes your perspective on things. And what it has me think about is what is what has been the value of my life up until this moment what have i done for myself and for others to bring about the most positive change that i can have i been maximizing on my capacity to generate the flourishment of others well-being And that's something to think about on on a, the, maybe not the illness part, but that's something to think about on a moment to moment basis. Basis is this reevaluation: Am I am I maximizing on life? Am I doing what I know I should be doing? Am I not wasting time on things that don't matter? Am I doing this a better way? Are there any areas where I'm sinking into the, into the, into the Satan that is satisfaction? Am I plateauing on something when I should be increasing, increasing it? Because think about it this way. When it comes to anything, whether it's a relationship you're having with another person um, or, or a personal pursuit of yours, maybe it's a hobby. Maybe you're 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 um, playing an instrument, or you're starting gardening, or or it's a martial art, or whatever it is. And life in general, you are either progressing or you're falling behind. You could say, "Oh, I'm maintaining. I'm maintaining. You know, I'm staying at the same level." But that also has to be thought about in terms of opportunity cost too, because the time that you're spending. The time that you're spending maintaining is time that you could be using improving. So in a way, it's like you are going backward because if you're not improving, you're going backward in a way because that 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 was an opportunity that was a chance for you to improve and you weren't improving. So in a way, uh, stagnation is devolution. So something to think about. Some people consider that an extreme mindset. Where they say that, you know, that's you, you, you can't be, you know, you got to cruise sometimes. You can't always be on, on the, you know, the freaking the, the, the rape and pillage path. You got to calm down sometimes. And yeah, you, it, it, it's important to be not necessarily on the rape and pillage path, but on the path, you have to be following the way and, and be in full acknowledgement of the way. And that sometimes requires cruising. 
You can be on the path while cruising as long as that cruising is for a specific purpose. You know, if you have four injuries, the fact that you're not exercising is you staying on the path because then your body can use that time and energy to recover those injuries instead of trying to exercise or or um, go to some sports practice more and then make those injuries, exacerbate those injuries and increase the recovery time. So it's it, it's context dependent and it's possible to chill and be on the path, but it's it's something, it's a rationalization that can creep into your mind so so rapidly that man you got to look out for it and then once you've made a decision you got to think about okay was i was think you know reflect on your thought process throughout the that five seconds or throughout those five minutes or five weeks was i rationalizing behavior was i telling myself that, that something was okay when in fact it was not okay you know were you eating eating muffins for 20 days straight. <laughs> you know, that's that's not okay. Were you were you just doing something that you know, maybe you was you were treating you you've had you know there's been a recent deadline at work and so you're under a lot of stress and so you take that out on other people. So you have to you have to think to yourself if if the way you've been behaving over the past day or past year has been okay. Always reevaluate. And this one, this one is good here. I'll I'll make this a, a short point about this one because it's it's something that's helpful for me to to get it done, essentially. So she was uh talking about what it's like living with her mother. Um, they, they had a property where there was the, the main house that her and, and Mitch were living in and the mother was staying in a separated, um, in a separated dwelling unit, a detached dwelling unit, detached accessory dwelling unit, um, like a cottage and on the same property. Um, so, so that's how they were able to care for her and that, Again, I guess kind of word word of the day is overwhelming when it comes to dealing with that. So she would have a lot of difficulty getting her own stuff because she was a writer. She had manuscripts due. Um, she she had her just professional life in general to carry on, to make money, to pay for caring for her mother, as well as living in general. And this is what she would say about helping her get through the days. Getting up, getting coffee, getting to work has always been the antidote. It's been a a tendency all my life to brood at dawn, but the year and a half of living with my mother's Alzheimer's has brought it to full fruition. Getting up, getting coffee, getting to work are still the antidote. Not that... I'm then a Vesuvius of enthusiasm and cheer, but the mix of brain chemicals that allows me the illusion that things will work out is somehow restored. So that's one thing that helps me. And it's, and it's become, I wouldn't say a mantra of myself, but, but something that I definitely, um, something is definitely in my mind that helps me in the morning to get up as she says, get up, get coffee, get to work. Um, for me, it's more like get up, make tea, <laughs> get to work. Um, but I, and, and my recent, uh, my recent morning, morning tea session has been with a very, a very good quality, um, uh, gunpowder green tea. <laughs> I was in the store with my girlfriend and I looked at the thing and I was like, well, it looks pretty good, but a little pricey. I'll try and find it somewhere else or find it online. And, and she was like, oh, you like that one? I was like, yeah, it looks pretty good. Don't you think so? And then, so she got it for me. So I was very grateful for that. I'm still, that was weeks and weeks, months ago. It, was it really months ago? And I'm still enjoying it to this day. Um, and, and it's very strong. So you really like you know, it, it, it's quite good. Anyway, getting up, making tea, getting to work. It's like, all right, you know, the day's got to start at some point. 
the day is, it's not going to not start. So you might as well start as soon as your day does, (laughs) which is to say, don't wake up and waffle about for an hour and a half on social media or, or doing this and that, or, um, just wasting time in general, get up and start your day. Know the thing, know the things that you need to do in the day in order. So you can just wake up and and get them done. For me, if it's a work day, I, I, I start my mornings the same way, the same way every time. So, so the first, so the first bit of my day. So from, from alarm to like end of morning ritual, I know what's happening. I know, I know straight up what's happening. That's like a three hour, that's like a three hour window. Um, and then outside of that, you know, outside of having just the the regular work day, I have a checklist of things that I need and want to do. And when I'm done with anything, I'm done with work or I'm done with a task, I just refer to the checklist and carry on to the next thing. And that's incredibly helpful. And what I notice is that there is there's one in the other and other is in the one. So uh, when it when it comes to whenever I get in a rut, whenever I fall into a rut, it is when I'm not doing the 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 not performing the self care that is of utmost meaning. So for me, it's physical and mental self care. You need to look after your physical well being. And, and, and just general, general kind of constitution of your physical well-being and general constitution of your mental well-being. And I do that every morning with reading and exercise. And I notice that when I'm in a rut, it's because I start to rationalize away that behavior. I say, oh, I didn't, you know, I, I got to, I got to bed late last night. So the following morning, I'll, I'll give myself an extra hour in bed and then I will, and then I'll do an abbreviated reading session, abbreviated exercise session. And it's when I start to do that. And then day after day, um, happens where, where I'm rationalizing that behavior to myself. That's when I get in a rut because then I'm not doing that, which fulfills me. Reading fulfills me incredibly and jump starts my brain for the day. Exercise um, clears that it kind of clears the tank in a way and allows you to have a fresh day going forward. So that's why it's important for me to knock both of those things out in the morning. Cause then I can say, at least at the end of the day, if everything else was horrible, I took care of myself and that's reassuring. So if it gets to the end of the day and I didn't, let's say I had a less productive than normal day at work or some event happened that was bad or, or things didn't go as planned, generally speaking, or maybe I'm just in a bad mood or whatever it is. And I also didn't take care of myself. um, I'm really behind. I'm really behind. So it's important not to rationalize. It's important to not be sad because that's what that is. It's that's falling into satisfaction. That is saying I'm satisfied with, with my kind of um, performance in this thing. So now I'm good. I'm coasting now. That's a problem. That's a problem. Never be satisfied. As Colonel Glover John said, always ask of yourself, how can this project be done better? And that project could be life itself. So how are you doing better? So. Got one last comment here. From the book. And back to the book. So at one point, um, at one point, Mary was, was, uh, you know, had a thing with John Updike. Oh, no, never mind. This is, she's referring to a John Updike tale. Totally, totally um, misconstrued that there. There's some other famous person that, that her mom, um, like there's a photo <laughs> that Eleanor was trying to find of her kissing this famous person. Cause it's just like, cool. Like it wasn't uh it wasn't a relationship that was good for her, but it was just a cool <laughs> photo. Um, I guess it's kind of bragging rights type of thing. Um, and 
this was actually just something that was just a good a good um kind of story idea um but I'll 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 let it out anyway she mentioned uh she says I remember John Updike tale where in the protagonist a man in his 60s thinks that he'd better come up with some new tricks fast to keep his creator entertained there's a brutal pragmatism to the process of superannuation when we're no longer a conduit for life, life loses interest in us. It's as simple as that. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll make a comment on that instead of on this miscellaneous story idea, because that's exactly what's going on here. When, when we're no longer a conduit for life, life loses interest in us. And that's the part that I should have highlighted instead of the, the part before that gave me the, the book idea. And maybe I'll actually go back, highlight it, and add another sticky note with my, with my thoughts on it. Because that's totally true. That's very similar to something Jocko Willink says uh, famously. Take the high ground or the high ground will take you. And that's what I love about reading in general and and reading something <laughs> going from something like Jocko Willink and the style and the the nature and style of his books to uh, uh, to the second person well i guess the first person account of someone who's taking care of her of her demented mother because when you learn when when your aim is to learn about human nature which is kind of at root, the reason I picked up this book is like, you know, what what is what is it about people when they are demented? You know, what is it about the that relationship and just that experience in general? So it's learning about human nature. And when you delve into, into the depths of those areas, you find the exact same messages. And that's what's so encouraging about reading. And if and if and if that's the lesson I can leave this podcast with, with each listener is that exactly is when you read whatever it is that you read the lessons come up everywhere just like musashi said when you know the way broadly you see it in everything and that's what's going on here right these these lessons these these pieces of dogma almost and it's i'm hesitant to call it dogma because that has almost a negative annotation but these are like proverbs of life <laughs> when we're not the conduit for it it loses interest in it in us so when we're not actively trying to channel change and and a positive continuation and what we're doing to try and make positive changes within ourself and make positive changes within others we are moving backward even if you are maintaining on life you're moving backward because think about think about what it is to maintain think about what it means for that in relation to time because if you're maintaining that means okay let's say today Today, Sunday, you are this person and and for 20 years worth of Sundays in the future, this is this is the Sunday that you are the same person as. So in the future, when you have relationships with other people, you have nothing to offer. Because there is nothing that has evolved since since today's Sunday. And all you'll be able to offer is, oh yeah, back in the day, this is what I did, or this is this is this contribution I had I I I I gave up, or like that I that I offered, or this is some this is some achievement that I worked my way toward. And when you're only talking about the past like that, you knew the only oh, new contributions are the only worthy contributions, <laughs> really. Otherwise, you're 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 relying on something that's no longer relevant, and that's not what we want in life. We want to never be satisfied. We want to never be satisfied. And I reckon. 
that concludes my thoughts for today. So thank you very much for listening. And if you want to find stuff I'm doing elsewhere, check out my Instagram. Remy Miller. Pretty simple. And other than that, farewell.